All right, we're uh, we are broadcasting, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so we're just gonna you know, give it a quick second to let our uh, audience build a little bit, uh, to let people tune in. Um, I just want to say thank you for tuning in to everybody uh, out there. Welcome uh, to my basement, and it looks like Kevin's dining room. Yeah, is that right? That's it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you're, it's a beautiful woodwork you have in your dining room, Kevin. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what sold us on the house. <laughs> yeah. What year is your house? Uh, 1920, uh, 22. Oh, fun. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Great arts and crafts type of architecture. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're crumb molding. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. Well, maybe in a future episode, we get a tour of your house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> So we got some more people tuning in, so we can probably get started. Uh, so okay. my name is John Harry. I'm the Programs Fellow here at the Milwaukee County S Historical Society. Obviously not not here, um, <laughs> but uh, you know where we we usually are. Um, and so we're trying to do one of these presentations about a week. Um, so we're looking at next Thursday doing a really interesting one about the mansions of Grand Avenue uh, with John Eastberg from the Paps Mansion. So that should be really really interesting. So keep a lookout on Facebook for uh for all that kind of thing uh and, and scheduling and stuff like that uh tonight we're uh, gonna tackle a really uh interesting topic that is probably on everybody's mind because it seems like everybody from politicians to the news to your neighbor is somehow now an expert on <laughs> the pandemic of influenza in 1918 and so, uh, so we're lucky enough uh, at the Milwaukee County Historical Society to actually have an expert about this time period on our staff here. Uh, so the guy below me uh, in the screen down there, that is Kevin Abing, he's our head archivist. Um, and so he's uh, he's in charge of keeping all our secrets safe. Um, but he also wrote a great book um, called A Crowded Hour, Milwaukee During the Great War. Um, and so as we'll hear tonight, the war plays into part of, uh, part, part of the flu pandemic and hysteria and, and uh, uh, just uh, the time period of what we're going through, uh, what America was going through. And specifically, we're looking at Milwaukee's lens there. Uh, so welcome, Kevin, to uh, this virtual talk. Thanks for uh, having this conversation tonight. Well, my pleasure, John. So um, let's get away from your book for a little bit, although you do write about this a little bit in the book, right? Yes. Yes, I do. So you can search for the book, um, and uh, and it's it's a it's a really interesting perspective on how the local uh, area was doing during the pandemic. Um, so we're going to move though to talking about the war, and I think we'll get back to the war a little bit, but specifically about the flu pandemic uh, that was going on in 1918. And so let's start from the beginning. So when did the Spanish flu occur, and why was it called that? Okay. Well, it. Um it started in early 1918 in Kansas. Um, and you know some of the, the soldiers at Camp Funston in Kansas uh, were infected, but it was a relatively mild uh, strain. And still, you know, most of them survived and it didn't really cause much of a you know, public uh, outcry, I guess. Um, and, but those soldiers that survived, they carried the virus with them when they were transferred to other army bases or overseas. And once it got overseas, um, it's thought that this virus mutated into a more uh, virulent uh, form, and it just just devastated, uh, you know, French, German, British, and American uh, um, fighting forces uh, overseas. And then, as soldiers were returning home to the U.S. Um, it, it made its way back to the U.S. in uh, you know late summer of 1918. Uh, it uh, it didn't get to Milwaukee until about mid September, um, and the photo that you see here is the uh, uh, Johnston Emergency Hospital, and that's where the first uh, two cases of the Spanish flu were were diagnosed. And um, it was called the Spanish flu because well it, it not because it had anything to do with Spain, but uh, because Spain was the only country in Europe that didn't have its press being censored. I mean, it wasn't involved in the fighting. And so, you know, the, the, the press in Spain could actually report on the devastation that was going on that was caused by the, by the flu. And, um, and so that's just how the term Spanish flu kind of derived from, from that. Um, Which is interesting but, because it started here and then it came back. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. 
and and when it came back, it was much more deadly than it was going overseas. So, um, and it it definitely it caught everybody off guard. I mean, they they, they weren't uh, suspecting or expecting anything like what actually happened. Um, sure. And uh, um, you know, I mean, as I said, you know, Milwaukee, you know, the first uh, first cases appeared in uh, mid September, and uh, um, you know, it just kind of snowballed from there. I mean, initially, uh, you know, the health care, you know, the, the, the health commissioner, George Rulin, you know, he was saying, telling the public that, it, you know, it, it's, it's not nothing to really get all that, you know, upset about or anything, because he says, you know, he doesn't want people to get scared. He said, you know, he basically right. said something like uh, that, uh, you know, it's the same old flu, you know, so there, there's no need to get all crazy because it's the Spanish flu. Well, they, uh, they found out pretty quickly after that, that 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 wasn't necessarily the case. So I'm looking, we're looking at this, uh, and w which hospital is this we see in the picture again? Oh, it's uh, the uh, Johnston Emergency Hospital is on Michigan, like third in Michigan Street. Okay, so right, right downtown. Yes. Okay, yeah. so obviously medical care looks different. <laughs> during this time period. Right. Did they have any treatments at that point? No, there was nothing. I mean, the only, I mean, there was no, no vaccine or, or, or anything like that. I mean, uh, when the, when the cases really started piling up, uh, what Rulin and the doctors were, were telling people basically the same thing that they're telling people today, you know, stay home. Uh, avoid crowds. Don't you know? You don't shake hands. Don't kiss. You know anything like that. You know no no contact like that at all. And I'm um, sure people listened, right? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, some did, some didn't. Um, because uh, when the when the uh, you know cases were first, you know, really if, the, when the pandemic here in Milwaukee first started getting going, you know, Ruland was warning people about crowds and that kind of thing, but. Um, you know, people were still, they were so focused on the war, what was going on there, uh, and they weren't all that concerned about following Ruland's orders. Um, sure. The fourth uh, the fourth Liberty Loan Parade uh, took place, yeah, I think it was like September 28th, 29th of, of 1918. And, I mean, you had like 25,000 people participating in the parade, and then God only knows how many thousands of people lining the streets. Sure. And, um, uh, you know, so it's a perfect breeding ground for passing this, you know, this germ around. I mean, because it, it was basically spread the same way as, you know, the coronavirus, you know, through coughs or sneezes, that kind of thing. Right. And if you got that many people packed, you know, so tightly, I mean, there's no telling how many people were infected just from that parade alone. And that, you know, there, there were all sorts of other, uh, you know, large gatherings that were going on as well. And, uh, um, Wow. Yeah. As I said, it was just it was a perfect breeding ground for, for spreading that germ. So the, when the flu got here and it started to spread even more, and people started to get sick even more, um, what measures did the, the, the 1918, you know, Wisconsin government or Milwaukee government try to enact other than to just say stay home? Were there anything else? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to his credit, George Rulin, I mean, he took steps almost immediately uh, to try to curtail the, the spread. Um, I mean, the very, very first case in Milwaukee was a soldier who was on leave from the uh, the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, uh, you know, just across the border in Illinois. And uh, as soon as, you know, that was diagnosed, Rulin, he contacted the commandant at the, at the Great Lakes and, you know, told him to basically, you know, to shut down, to st stop granting furloughs um, and put the, put the whole base on under quarantine and, which he did, but, you know, by that time, it, the genie's out of the bottle. I mean, cause uh, the soldiers that were on, on furlough in Mo going to Milwaukee or going to Chicago, I mean, you know, the, the disease is out there already. So, right. I mean, it was, Kind of like you know closing the barn door after ever the cows have left um but uh um but beyond that i mean he uh in in uh you know mid-october he shut down really closed schools 
I uh, closed theaters and restaurants and sounds know, familiar. Much, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, he pretty much barred any kind of you know public gathering, um, and you know he even <laughs> took steps to uh, kind of. Uh, curtail activity at, at two Milwaukee uh, core institutions, uh, church and <laughs> taverns. Uh, I mean, because they could they could stay open, but uh, you know, in the turn for saloons, they could only let someone come in. They could buy a drink, they could drink it, and they had to leave. They couldn't they couldn't linger. People couldn't congregate there. Um, and then with churches, I mean, that basically, I mean, they. Well, you know, uh, the, the Archbishop uh, Mesmer, he closed down all the, you know, Sunday and weekday masses for, for Catholics and, and the other uh, denominations, they pretty much followed suit. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, priests, they could still, you know, have, they could conduct weddings or funerals, but only immediate family um, uh, could could attend those, those, those uh, events or, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so, you know, so, I mean, he definitely, you know, he took those steps, he closed the zoo, you know, I mean, and, and anything where people were gathering, uh, he tried to shut it down. And, uh, you know, and, and again, he was encouraging people to, you know, do the social distancing thing, though they, they didn't call it that, but, you know, encourage people to just stay home, avoid crowds, uh, you know, as much as possible. Um, and, uh, um, but it, it was, it was tough. It was difficult. I mean, cause Milwaukee, um, it was, it was a very densely populated uh, city at the time. And, you know, the streetcar system was the primary way to, to get around town. And, you know, you can't, uh, stop, you know, crowds of people from getting on streetcars. I mean, and, uh, um, so, so no matter what, rule and try to do i mean it, it definitely it helped but right. it wasn't enough to, to stop the spread of, of the flu so we've got a you know the, the first picture we have up here today is one of the first hospital where yeah. cases of this influenza were found in milwaukee um and i guess i'm leading into the next picture but what you know we have today for coronavirus at state fair park they have an overflow facility and did and they had something like that around this time too right Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, because Milwaukee, um, compared to other, you know, comparably sized cities, didn't really have as many hospitals as other cities did. Uh, and so, I mean, there was a shortage of hospital space. And uh, um, so Ruland, uh, and, you know, he had appointed a special commission or advisory board uh, to help coordinate, you know, efforts to stop the spread. Um, and the first thing they had to do was find more hospital space. And so they, uh, uh, they were able to get money from the county board and from the, the uh, city council uh, to, to uh, buy or, or convert the, the, there was a Nunnemacher uh, mansion on 17th in Wisconsin um, to convert that into uh, emergency hospital space. And then the photo that's up here now is of the Milwaukee Auditorium and they converted a couple of halls within that uh, into isolation uh, hospital space as well. And so, I mean, they were they were really scrambling to find uh, to find room for you know to treat as many people as they could. And the other other factor kind of uh, that compounded the, mi the misery, I guess, is that most of the the, the doctors in Milwaukee. They were in the service that, you know, so they were overseas. And so, um, you know, the, the medical staffs, uh, you know, the nurses and the doctors in Milwaukee that were in Milwaukee, I mean, they were overwhelmed, basically. Sure. sure. Um, how did Milwaukee's efforts, because this was a worldwide pandemic, kind of like what we're going through now. And so you had other major cities going through similar things. How did how did Milwaukee's efforts compare to other cities? Did they take it more seriously, less seriously? I think Milwaukee. I mean, if you look at the the uh, number of deaths and the, and the de the percentage of of deaths in in the city, I mean, Milwaukee fared better than pretty much any city in the country. Um, the the cities that were really slammed were those of, on the eastern seaboard, uh, Philadelphia especially. I mean, Philadelphia alone had over 17,000 deaths. Wow. 
whereas Milwaukee, uh, by the end of 1918, Milwaukee had uh, a little over 1,100 deaths from the flu. Uh, so in comparison, I mean, we did much better um, than, than you know, the cities out east. And a lot of that is due to, well, the steps that, that Ruland uh, put into place, but also, I mean, for, by and large, for the, the, the general public, they pretty much followed the uh, Ruland's, uh, um, you know, his advice and, you know, tried to stay home as much as possible and that kind of thing. But, uh, but uh, um, you know, I mean, it was still, it was a little bit different because, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, how today, <laughs> They were having Facebook presentations about things. I'll tell you that. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was no social media or anything like that right. at the time. And um, so the, you know, the way that Ruland and the, the health department got the word out uh, around the city was just, you know, through posters and pamphlets and leaflets and that kind of thing. And, and, and they published them in all sorts of different languages because Milwaukee was such a ethnically diverse city. Um, so they had them in every language imaginable you know, just to get the word out to people and hopefully they would take heed and, and follow that advice. Um, and, but you know, the, the tough thing is at, at the time, I mean, there was world war going on. Right. And so, I mean, even though a lot of the businesses like the movie theaters, restaurants and things like that were shut, essential, uh, you know, factories, essential businesses that were doing, you know, defense de uh, department contracts and things like that, they were still going. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, that, uh, you know, definitely didn't, you know, necessarily help, you know, help the cause, but, but as I said, you know, you have a war, a war going on and, uh, you know, they, they needed to keep that, uh, that those supplies uh, moving forward. So the next thing we have is this sign here. And so tell, tell us a little bit about, because I, I've been seeing reproductions of images like this sign and kind of where a sign like this falls into the storyline. Okay. Well, it's, uh, they didn't really use these too, too much in the first wave of the Spanish flu in Milwaukee. I mean, it's, it was more uh, widely used when that second wave hit in, uh, in late November. And, so and the second wave. Well, uh, the, the first wave, you know, started, you know, mid September and it peaked, in mid-October, and then it kind of declined enough to the point where uh, by November 4th, uh, Rulin had lifted the ban on public gatherings. And uh, so, you know, people being cooped up for three plus weeks, I mean, they didn't need much of a, an excuse to get outside and, and you know, try to, to resume their normal lives. Right. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, and then plus there was an election uh, just like we had the other other week, uh, there was an election uh, held the, the day after Ruland lifted the order. So you had groups of people going to vote. Um, uh, yeah, there were, geez, yeah, you know, again, all sorts of large gatherings, that kind of thing. And I mean, Ruland was still cautioning people to, you know, uh, you know, take care, to avoid right. crowds, that kind of thing. But, you know, people really weren't listening too, too much. And that, uh, uh, I think, definitely helped uh, resurgence of this flu in, uh, in by, by late November. And uh, so you had this third wave. And this is when the, these, these influenza signs were really being posted all over town on houses where there were, you know, people sick with the flu. And uh, um, so, you know, they would have that. And then there would be a quarantine sign also uh, uh, placed along with these things so that, uh, uh, yeah, you know, just trying to isolate people as much as possible. So very different from that that part so far being very different from today. Yes. Yeah. Um, as far as speaking about pandemics and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so you talked about November and another wave of the flu coming with that. And of course, November 11th, 1918 is a very historically important date. That's yeah. World War One ends, or technically, right? Yeah, um, yeah. That's, that's the, the, the 11th hour, 11th day type thing. Um, and so uh, what did Milwaukee 
I'm guessing people were happy that war was over, so they must have celebrated. Oh yeah, absolutely. And actually, there were there were uh, a couple of occasions where the whole city just went nuts um, because on November seventh, there was like a false alarm. I mean, there were reports that the war had ended. Uh, it turned out to be false reports, but you know that people didn't really care because they just started going nuts, and you had parades everywhere and that kind of thing. Um, but then when they found out that it wasn't true, they were, you know, they were pretty discouraged or upset, that kind of thing. A lot of grumbling going on, but it didn't take long for them to have another chance when it, you know, the armistice was actually signed on November 11th. And here in this photo, you can see where, I mean, there's a big crowd on down on East Wisconsin Avenue, uh, you know, and that was just, that's just one small part of the city. I mean, there were parades all over. Uh, and and the, the, the saloons were filled to capacity sure. and people toasting the end of the war and that kind of thing. Um, so there were very many people at all that were paying attention to that, you know, uh, ruling and his order to try to avoid crowds. I mean, they, it was ignored completely, basically. And, and it's things like this that help bring that, uh, that third wave of, of the Spanish flu back. Do you, um, do you like, it's interesting to me and I, I think to a lot of people, cause we're now just learning about this because of world war one. And I'm just wondering like, at what point did this kind of, I don't want to say get written out, but become less relevant where just world war one was being reported on. Well, I mean, that's, that's an interesting uh, question. I mean, I don't know that there's one, specific point in time where it just kind of got pushed to the back burner in our in our conscience. Uh, I mean, even while it was going on, I think more, more people were, you know, more interested in what was going on with the war versus, you know, with this, this flu. Uh, but I mean, once it had subsided, um, it, you know, I, I think e even almost immediately after, after the, the pandemic had, had, ended or you know became a, a threat worldwide um i think for the most part uh you know people they, they i think they just wanted to put that in in the you know in the back on the back burner um because world war one I, I mean there was just such this um there was so much of a, a frenzy going on during the war anyway i mean with uh, i mean you know, all this anti-german hysteria that was going on in Milwaukee, especially, but all over the country, uh, and in Milwaukee, you had a lot of anti-socialist uh, hysteria going on as well. Um, and so, I mean, you got that—you know—that mentality uh, that that was in place already. And then, you know, the the war itself, because you've got you know like the the bad villains like the Kaiser in Germany, and and then you've got the, you know, the heroes, the, the good guys of the Americans and the Briti British and the French as well. Um, I just think it was just, a, I think, a more, a more black and white uh, uh, event, I guess, in people's minds. I think it was easier for them to deal with that than to try to really, um, I guess, assess the, the long-term impact of this, you know, basically an invisible foe. Yeah. You know, they couldn't see it. They didn't know how to fight it. And, and so I think they just kind of pushed that to the background. So did the flu just kind of tri trickle out at some point? Or how did it end? Well, I mean, there, it, it continued into, you know, into 1919. Um, but it, you know, it, it's, it started to subside about by that time. And, um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly when it kind of faded away. Uh, but I mean, it was, you know, definitely by in, in I'd say by mid 1919, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an issue anymore. Sure. So, um, we've got some questions, uh, from, uh, our awesome Facebook audience. They're mm -hmm. super engaged in this topic, which is great. So thanks to everybody who's 
you know, tuned in for uh, this uh, this talk tonight. And uh, like I said, every Thursday, we're going to try to do bring you another something uh, like this uh, because we're all stuck at home. So let's let's do something and, and see how we can uh, see our world differently during this. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in the comments um, and uh, uh, we'll try to get to them here over the next, I don't know, five, 10 minutes and then we'll probably wrap it up. So um, so let's see. There's a new software we're using, too. So let's see how this works. Look at that. Uh, Genevieve says, do you know how long it took for an immunization uh, for the Spanish flu? But I don't I don't believe that they ever actually developed a vaccine to, to combat the flu. Um, so, I mean, the flu is that flu anyway. Right. Right. Yes, exactly. Because um, I mean, it, it had pretty much, you know, died off or faded away before, uh, you know, because his medicine back then was <laughs> was much different from what it is today. And, uh, you know, I mean, today they're saying, what, 12, 18 months to develop a vaccine. You know, God only knows how long it would have taken back then to develop that. Sure. Um, so now we'll go to Carl's question. Uh, do you have any information about how the epidemic in Milwaukee impacted the port of Milwaukee or the Milwaukee maritime related industries? Oh, uh, boy. Uh, I, I don't really. Uh, all I know is that, I mean, there was still a lot of shipping going on because of all the defense work that was being done in Milwaukee. And I mean, and those goods were, you know, were being shipped out. So I got to believe that I'm sure that the uh, uh, amount of material, you know, going out uh, was reduced. Uh, but but I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure it, that it, it kept going. So, um, so sure. I, but, I, but I couldn't tell you exactly, exactly how that impacted the port. Sure. Um, Marcella is asking, where can I find more on this? Um, so Kevin, you wrote a really great article on the Milwaukee Independent. Um, and so that link, somebody posted in here already. Um, so there it is right there. Okay. So if you just search Milwaukee Independent, you can find a more in-depth article about, about all this um it too um and then of course i'll go back to your book here uh so you get that, if you're making a big order on amazon uh pop that in your cart um <laughs> so, make it um, a big order <laughs> yeah make it a big order yeah right um so uh on uh one of our comments rick is asking uh did they have protests in 1918 like we do now no, not not that I ever uh, came across. Um, I mean, there was a lot of grumbling, uh, but there wasn't quite the, I guess, as severe a shutdown as uh, as there is now because there were so many defense businesses that and factories that were still open. Uh, so uh, you, you know, there there I guess wasn't that that need, I suppose, you know, by, uh, on the part of some people to protest the, the steps that, uh, that Ruland had put in place. Uh, but as I, as I said, there, there was a lot of grumbling about, uh, about what was going on, that kind of thing. But, uh, um, sure. but not to the extent that we're seeing now. Sure. So I think, and I think we've gotten, ooh, maybe we have one more. Uh, nope. Uh, your assistant archivist, Steve, is telling people to buy your book. So, there you go. Uh, Oswell, well, yeah. so if you want to stay local and not give Jeff Bezos any more money, which, you know, is great. Uh, Boswell Books might have it locally and they're doing cur curbside pickup too. So support your local booksellers for sure. Um, uh, Sandy is asking what ages were most affected with the flu and were children affected? Well, that, that's one of the interesting things about the, the Spanish flu is that, I mean, you would expect that it would be the very young or the very old that were most affected, but that wasn't the case. Um, most of the people that, that perished uh, during the pandemic were what, 15 to 40 years old. So, you know, people in the prime of their lives. Uh, and, um, and I haven't come across, you know, any kind of, uh, uh, explanation for why that was the case but but you know that that's that's what happened um so we have uh gene here this is an interesting i've i don't know if i've heard this before um my grandma had this flu and told me she lost her hair oh. she, she lost her or from the flu if it was shaved to bring down her fever boy uh i haven't ever haven't ever heard that either um uh, and I'm, so I'm afraid I, I don't uh, I don't uh, have right. an answer for you, Gene. I'm sorry about that. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it is an interesting question, though. 
So, um, so it looks like we've answered all the questions. Ooh, we got one more question. And then, uh, oh, Tom Faring is answering, asking one. We're trying to get him lined up for a talk in the next few weeks. Uh, so this will be our last question, and then we'll go to our big wrap-up. Um, so uh, were schools closed in Milwaukee and in the rest of Wisconsin? And if so, like how long were they actually closed for? Well, yeah, the, the, definitely there's all the schools in Milwaukee, except for the Milwaukee Normal School. Why there, that exception was made, I'm not sure. But but all the other the, you know elementary and secondary and, and parochial schools were all closed um, I think from uh, October 14th up into early November until uh, when uh, Rulin lifted the order, uh, you know, as, uh, against uh, public gatherings and all. But then it, they were closed again uh, when that third wave uh, hit, and then they were closed. Uh, boy, I think it was again like early December up until they, they finally reopened again in, on January uh, 2nd of 1919. Hmm. And um, I, again, I don't know exactly, you know, uh, if all the school districts around the state follow that, uh, that example, uh, but, but I know that they did close um, hmm. at, at some point. Uh, I'm just not sure how long they, they were closed. Sure. All right, so uh, we're going to let everybody go back to the, their world. Um, I think the draft is on tonight, which is the first yeah. sports contest that anybody's <laughs> had. Packers haven't picked yet. Packers haven't picked yet. Well, no, yeah, yeah, late pick, right? So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of people that want to draw parallels to COVID-19, to the, to, to the Spanish flu, and obviously very different scientifically, uh, different kinds of things. Um, but do you think – that Milwaukee's actions in 1918 provide any sort of insight to what we're counter encountering today and a roadmap. Oh yeah, I think absolutely. Um, I mean, I think you know just the fact that um, the, the social distancing, the isolation uh, part of the of the equation, it, it worked. It helped. Um, but then you know we just don't want to be, um, uh, I guess too over eager to you know uh resume life normally because it, as we saw in milwaukee in 1918 it, it can come back um, um you know i mean i i can appreciate you know the, the frustration that people are uh that are experiencing right now and you know they're eager to resume life you know as it was before um believe me i going through that as well. Uh, but, um, you know, we just don't want to be too, too hasty. I mean, Americans, uh, by and large today, we're not really accustomed to, you know, sacrificing things like this. Um, and so, I mean, this, this is definitely, this is a test, um, you know, uh, where, you know, we, we praise the, the people on the front line, the first responders, that kind of thing. And they, and they deserve every, bit of that praise uh but i mean you know if we if we really want to honor them do what they say and stay home and you know and flatten the curve and you know get this thing under control i mean um you know to paraphrase an old cold war uh, uh expression it's better to be in the red than dead so sure well, thank you, Kevin. Um, and again, your so your book's on sale. You can get it at local booksellers, online booksellers. Um, uh, your assistant archivist, Steve, though, uh, put, uh, you know, we don't have it online at the moment, but if you either call tomorrow um, or if you just send us a message on Facebook, um, we can, uh, we'll get one shipped to you. So we'll work that out. So if you, if you would like to read more about Milwaukee during this time period, um, fascinating book that Kevin wrote um, that we can we definitely have in stock and we definitely can ship out to you uh, because I, I've been getting a lot of reading done during this. I don't know about you, Kevin. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> not having you really changes things. So, but thanks for everybody for uh, tuning in today. Um, and uh, uh, there's also an article somebody posted in here on the Milwaukee Independent that Kevin wrote about this too. So if you want more information on uh, how the 1918 flu impacted Milwaukee, there's definitely more places that you can look for more info. Uh, we can't. Can't wait to see you all in person at some point again. Um, but like Kevin said, we're, we got to do our part um, so that this becomes an overshadowed part of history, hopefully. Um, so 
Um, so uh, next week we'll be uh, bringing you a talk a week from today again. Uh, we're looking at getting John Eastberg from the Pap Paps Mansion talking about uh, Victorian homes on uh, Grand Avenue. So uh, stay tuned on Facebook for that. And thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you again soon. All right. Bye.